My name's Bruce Fumi and I'm a Scottish tour guide and today I'm going to take a walk down the Royal Mile and give you one or two interesting tidbits from its history. So, if you're interested in the people, places and events in Scottish history, then click the subscribe button at the bottom right of the screen and ring the notification bell to be told when I upload new videos. In the meantime, let me tell you some stories. For those of you that don't know about Scotland's capital, I should probably start with the obvious. Just south of the Forth Estuary, there's an old disused volcano. Many years after the fire and brimstone was all mined out, they built an Iron Age fort that over the years was upgraded and is now a castle. There's a hill that slopes down a Scots mile into the valley and there, King David I built an abbey. Then other kings built a palace, and then elected politicians built a monstrous carbuncle around a debating chamber. I'm going to start at the castle esplanade and walk down the hill, pointing out some things along the way. Let's start with a monument to Ensign Ewart. This is the final resting place of Charles Ewart, sergeant in the Scots Greys. Now, some of you'll know the Scots Grey from that famous painting, Scotland Forever, representing their charge against Napoleon at the Battle of Waterloo. But their origins were much earlier, with a troop of horse raised for John Graham at Cleaver House and the domestic suppression of Presbyterian Covenanters in the 1680s. But they fought against Jacobites too. Charles Ewart was part of that charge of the Scots Greys at Waterloo and as the Greys attacked the French 45th Regiment on the line he hacked his way through musket ball, lances, bayonets and blood to capture the regimental eagle. This was huge. Glory for the regiment and shame for the French. You can still see the captured eagle in Edinburgh Castle's museum to this day. Now, Charles Ewart was fated and dined out on that for the rest of his life. He was promoted to the rank of ensign, lived out life in a pension and was a star of the after-dinner speaking circuit. He's even got a pub in the Royal Mile named after him. The pub is on the Lawn Market. That's the bit that runs down from the West Bow to St Giles Street. I always assumed that back in the day, they sold grass seeds and lawnmowers in the lawn market, but apparently no. They tell me that they sold cloth and linen and stockings and the like. That was known as inland goods, and the land market changed pronunciation to the lawn market. Now, a key feature of the Royal Mile are the closes either side of the street that run down each hill on either side, and I want to show you one of them. This is Lady Stairs Close, leading through to Lady Stairs House. Now these closes were often named after the people who owned them, and Lady Stair was the wife of John Dalrymple, first Earl of Stair. He was the Scottish nobleman and all-round baddie who was behind the massacre of Glencoe, and campaigning for the Act of Union in 1707. His widowed wife, Lady Stair, bought this building in 1719. And as you can see from the plaque, Robert Burns lived here on his first visit to Edinburgh in 1786. Now, you can also see from the stonework that the current building's more modern, and Burns actually lived in an original part that's been built over called Baxter's Close. But if you go through this close, you come to a quaint courtyard in the Writers Museum dedicated to Robert Burns, Walter Scott and Robert Louis Stevenson. This building to the left of Lady Stairs Close is Gladstone's Land, built in the reign of Mary Queen of Scots and remodelled by a wealthy merchant, Thomas Gladstone's, during the reign of her son James VI in 1620. It's now run by the National Trust for Scotland. There are so many buildings up and down the Royal Mile that are more modern, but here's a place that you can come, take a tour, and get a taste 
of what life was like in the 17th century. And I always say that a visit here should be done as the first of two stops because over in Charlotte Square, built as part of the new town in the 18th century, is the Georgian House. Visiting this and then the Georgian House after will give you a flavour of how Edinburgh was changing between the 17th and the 18th century when the new town was a new town. In fact, it was when Robert Burns lived there that they were in the process of building that new town. But there's another old town close I want to show you. On the other side of the lawn market from Gladstone's Land is Riddle's Close. 20 years before Gladstone's Land was remodelled, in 1595, one of the wealthiest merchants in Edinburgh called John McMorran lived here. As Bailey of the town, he also had duties of keeping the peace. In 1595, schoolboys at the Edinburgh High School were complaining about the length of their holidays. As a protest, they barricaded themselves into the old Blackfriars Monastery, up where the Pleasance is today. And after a couple of days, along with some men of the town, the town council sent Bailey John McMorran, who lived in this close, to deal with the young scallywags. As the adults were about to break the door down with battering ram, a 13-year-old boy fired a shot and it struck McMorran right in the napper and killed him stone dead. You can imagine that the boys panicked and ran. Of course, they were captured. Now, you and I know if it had been some poor street urchin or stonemason's apprentice, they would have strung him up further down on the Royal Mile. But they weren't ordinary boys. These were posh, late 16th century Edinburgh schoolboys. William Sinclair, the boy who'd done the murder, was a relative of the Earl of Caithness. Both victims and culprits were wealthy, important people. The king was petitioned. Lord Hume made representations for an English lad who was then sent back south. A plea was made to the Privy Council and more were released. The families of the boys would contribute for churches to be built. Eventually, even William Sinclair, the gunman himself, was released without further punishment. And I'm told that this is where the English get their expression to get off scot free. As we pass into the High Street, we see the Great St Giles, which is really the High Kirk, but marketing. Anyway, we pass a statue of the great Enlightenment thinker, David Hume. Don't rub his toe, he would have hated it. We see Adam Smith, but the statue that I like most is that of James Braidwood. James Braidwood. James Braidwood was a cabinet maker's son who became a surveyor and he was specifically interested in reducing fire risk. He managed to persuade the people in power that Edinburgh should have a public municipal fire service, which is why Edinburgh had the first public fire service in the world ever. How long was it before the first call out? Two months. You see, on the 15th of November, 1824, a dish of hot linseed oil was knocked over in an engraving workshop in Old Assembly Close in the High Street. This started a fire that would rage for five days. You might have walked up the Royal Mile and not noticed the sudden change in the buildings. This is where the frontage was saved or rebuilt. Now, I'm not going to go into Braidwood's whole story here. I've made a video about him and you can click top right to see it. Spoiler alert, after setting up the first municipal fire service here, he was headhunted down to London. He died fighting a fire in that town. But his statue stands here as a monument, as do the very buildings of the Royal Mile, some of which may only survive because of James Braidwood. And a downpour of rain five days into the Great Fire at Edinburgh. 
Now, given that we're talking of emergency services, before I leave the High Street portion of the Royal Mail, I should point out that this is also the site of the first ever police murder in Scotland. Now, by that I mean that on Hogmanay 1812, a gang of criminals beat to death Officer Murray as he tried to keep them from mugging new town gents come up to the old town to enjoy festivities. Again, you can get the detail in a video that I made if you click top right, but I got the story from a book written by a mate from my village called Gary Knight. The book's called Fatal Duty, and it's published by Tipper Muir Books. The perpetrators were hung here in the high street, opposite the location of their crime. Very different treatment to the posh schoolboy killer. That being said, what about an advert for myself? If you haven't already heard my live stand-up show Stories of Scotland, it's coming to Toronto, Halifax, New Glasgow, Annapolis, Moncton, Montreal, Ottawa, Perth, Fergus, Seaforth, Calgary, Vancouver and Victoria. Click top right or the link in the description for details. Now, we passed St Giles Cathedral and gave it little comment. It's worth a whole video of its own, to be honest. Maybe even a series. Of course, I've already made several videos about his most famous minister, John Knox, who lived in this house here. He didn't like the attack a dram either. So we'll pass it by. Similarly, we're going to pass the World's End pub, famous for the horrific murders in 1977, but named because this is where the town gates of Edinburgh stood. So passing through the gates to the dangers of the outside world, you were at the world's end. This was a different borough, based around Holyrood. And this part of the Royal Mile, the road from Holyrood Abbey towards the town that the religious men would walk, became known as the Canon's Gate. It was a different borough. It had its own toll booth, it had its own Merkit Cross, and in Holyrood Abbey, it had its own church. But James VII, second if you're English, decided that he wanted Holyrood as a royal chapel with all its papist frippery. And so he moved out the local congregation, which is why they had to build the Canons Gate Kirk. Wait till you see the host of celebrities buried in the Cannons Gate courtyard. And this is one of them. Robert Ferguson was a Scots poet. He was an inspiration to Robert Burns, whose lodgings we passed earlier today. In fact, it was Burns who paid for the gravestone to Ferguson that sits in the courtyard to this day. Adam Smith is in here. They tell me Mary Queen of Scots murdered Secretary Rizzio is in here. Although that would mean a Catholic would have had to have been dug up and reinterred more than a hundred years later in a Protestant churchyard. The point is, you can go online and get a map of all the celebs buried in this graveyard. I want to tell you about one couple because this is a gravestone to Alexander Brunton and Mary Balfour, the son of a corset maker who lived in one of the dilapidated, wooden-fronted, high tenement houses long gone from the lawn market where we were earlier. Now, Alexander Brunton was far from posh, but he was clever. I mean, he didn't go to university or anything, but he was clever. He went to Edinburgh High School, and it seems that after that, he spent some time in Orkney as a tutor to two sons of a military couple now living in Orkney. He took a shine to their sister, but it wasn't deemed of suitable standing to be entertained by the colonel and his wife. In fact, they sent their daughter to the tiny island of Gursey to make sure that she was well out of the way. Although not university educated, Alexander was licensed by the Presbytery of Linlithgow to preach in the Church of Scotland. 
At the age of 25, he got his own congregation in East Lothian. That's when he headed up to Orkney, rode out to the little island of Gersey, swept the young Mary Balfour off her feet, and they eloped to a life of parish church romance. He went on to be Minister of the Greyfriars Kirk, then the Tron Kirk in the Royal Mile. He was probably there when the Great Fire of Edinburgh brought down the Tron steeple. But that's not all. This man, who'd never had a university education, went on to be Professor of Hebrew and Oriental Languages at Edinburgh University. He was elected Fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh, Moderator of the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland and more. As if there was more. Unlike many of the men of his time, he encouraged his wife to take an interest in philosophy, languages and mathematics. She went on to become a celebrated writer. They tell me that her first novel, titled Self Control, outsold the works of a contemporary female writer called Jane Austen. They seem like a blissfully happy couple, each successful in their own right at a time when that might seem unusual. Sometimes Scottish stories are happy. There's much more than this to see in the Royal Mile, but hopefully this just gives you a taster. If you'd like to take a road trip to other historic places in Scotland, then there are videos coming up on screen now. We can only keep this channel going with support from you, so why not click top right and become a Patreon member or buy me a coffee in the description below. I mean, Dawkins can be a lot of my life. Cheery and drastic.